So I'm going to kick it off with the word rebellion. I want to talk about that. How many of you are rebellious? How many of you think of yourselves as rebellious? Okay, there we go. Three of us in here. You know, the, the story of Genesis is about the rebellion of human beings. Uh, and it's all about rebellion. Quite frankly, the passage we're in today is all about rebellion as well. And, and rebellion has its origin in basically this. I will call the shots. I determine right and wrong. I'm the one who decides those things. I will map out the course of my own life. And, uh, and really, God calls that rebellion because God says, I, I want you to know me. I, I want you to know I created you. I, I want you to know who I am. I want, I want my will to be done because there's no other way you're going to make it unless my will is done. I want to determine right and wrong. I, I want you to thrive as you follow me. But rebellion sets in. Re rebellion sets into our lives. Rebellion set it into the life of Adam and Eve. Rebellion set into the lives of the people in Genesis 11, where we are today. So if you've got a Bible, turn, and we're going to be reading that passage in just a moment. It's the passage called the Tower of Babel, but I think it's misnamed by the people that actually kind of translated the Bible. It's not really about a tower at all. I mean, yeah, there's a tower in it, but it's, it's about rebellion. It's about people saying, we want to rebel against God. We want to determine right and wrong. We want to go our own way. It's a story about those things. It's not a story about people trying to make their way to heaven. Uh, they knew they couldn't. They, 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 they tried to make themselves great, but not necessarily make their way to heaven. Nor is it a story about an insecure God who is threatened by people building a tower. It's a story about rebellion. So let's take a look. We're going to read through Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, and let's now listen to what we are told. Now, the whole world, beginning in Genesis 11, 1, the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shiner and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Let, they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar or bitumen, depending on your translation. They, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the tower the people were building. The Lord says, uh, the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us, a hint of the Trinity here, let us confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused their language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So what's going on? You know, let, let, let me just mention, it's about the word rebellion. But this is about 100 to 150 years after Noah's Ark settles on the top of the mountain and, uh, and Noah and his three sons and, and their wives and then later their children and great-grandchildren and so forth end up populating the place. About 100 to 150 years later, this passage takes place. Noah now has great, 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 great grandchildren. And so a lot of people are crowding around this one area. Some people have started to venture off into surrounding areas areas. And what you see is already the lines of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. For those of you that weren't here last week, the sons of Noah, the lines of Shem, Ham, and Japheth that, that become the different nations all over the world are already starting to mark their own cultural uniqueness. That, that They're already starting to resemble their own cultural uniqueness. And, and God wants them to thrive in their own cultural environment and setting. But <laughs> But the people are stuck in one city, refusing to be scattered. And here is where they build Babel. So I want to make you three points that are in your outline about the story of Babel, just so that we can understand what it is and find our place in the story as well. And the first point is this. This city, Babel, was built on fear, mistrust, 
and pride. Well, where do you get that? Well, I get that from verse 4. So go back to verse 4 with me and, and look at really the motivation for building Babel. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. First of all, fear. You know, what's the fear? Well, they are afraid of being scattered over the face of the whole earth. And that's what they're afraid of, that they're not wanting to be scattered. You know, they're, and, but, but, but by the way, if you read Genesis 1 or Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, God has already said to Adam and Eve and then to Noah, I want you to be scattered. Uh, I, want, I want your descendants to fill the earth and multiply. God has basically said, my will is that you be scattered, but yet they had a fear of being scattered. That they, they feared, what they feared the most was exactly what God wanted. You know, and they were afraid, I think, first of all, of what was out there. And they were afraid that if they went out there, they wouldn't be enough or have enough. Why? Because at the heart of fear is mistrust. I mean, let's get honest. If you and I lay awake worrying at nights and we go through our day worrying and fearing, uh, at the heart of that is mistrust. I mean, we fear that we won't be enough or have enough. <laughs> but, but fear's focus is always on ourselves and on the circumstance and not on God. And that's the problem with fear. It's, it's, a, it's an internal focus. It's a focus on ourselves. It's a focus on what we have or what we don't have instead of focusing on God. And at the heart of fear is a mistrust, a, a, not trusting that God is good enough or able enough to meet our needs. Uh, and so that's where the people are. So 100 to 150 years after Noah, the people have drifted into a culture where they're thinking, I'm not sure if God is good enough. You know, I'm not sure if he really cares about us. I mean, after all, he kind of wiped out the world in a flood. I mean, what's to keep him from doing that again? Yes, he gave a promise to Noah, but we don't really know this God. You know, and here this culture is developing that is saying, we're not sure God is good enough. Or they are saying, we're not sure God is able enough to actually meet the needs that we have. If we scatter, we're not, we're not sure we can actually trust this God, and there is a deep mistrust. You know, you and I do the same things, don't we? God, I'm not sure that if I step into the situation, I'll be enough or I'll have enough. And, and so we kind of recoil in fear. You know, God, God I, I know that you tell me if I am a follower of yours to, to go and, and make disciples, but I'm not sure I want to talk to people. You know, I'm, I'm not sure I actually want to engage people in this. So, you know, I'm just talking to those of us that are followers of Christ. And, and we recoil in fear because, because we're afraid that we aren't enough or that we won't be enough, but our focus is on ourselves and on our circumstance and not on God. And that's a part of the problem, and that's where fear is. And fear, whenever we give in to fear, we end up building Babel in our own lives. And we end up building this, this fortress, if you will, so that, so that we think that we might have enough or be enough. Why? Because we mistrust. And we don't trust that God is enough or has enough. And so look at this tower they build. Let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Uh, let, let me just make a few statements about this tower. First of all, some people say, you know, this is a ziggurat, and a ziggurat is these ancient towers that were built so that people might somehow get closer to God. You know, also they're called high places in other places in the Old Testament where, where, where people not knowing God thought, maybe I'll get closer to God if I go if I go closer to the heavens. But I don't think that's why they built this. Because if you look at where they built, they built in the valley. And if they wanted to try to get closer to God, they would have built on all the mountains surrounding this valley. But they built in the valley. I think they built for three reasons. And let me give you the three reasons that I believe why they built. And I believe the passage highlights, first of all, they didn't trust that the world wasn't going to flood again that they didn't trust that God wasn't going to flood them again. And so they're going to build a tower big enough to withstand the flood if it comes. Why? Because they don't trust that God is good enough. Even though God said to Noah, I will never do this again. I will never flood the world again. I, I, I think they, they don't trust God's word. Well, why, do you and I, why do you and I struggle? You know, why do you and I give in to fear? It's the same reason we don't trust God's word. And, and, and when it comes to God's word, we, we're, we're not sure. Or if we don't trust God's word, we don't trust God's character. And that's where they are. 
The second reason why I believe they built the tower is because they didn't trust each other. In this ever-expanding city, they wanted to keep an eye on other people. And I'll get to why in a minute. But it's a very top-down, very totalitarian kind of government that you see here emerging in Babel. And as, as the city expands, they want to make sure that they keep their thumb on everybody. And so they build this high tower. And then the third reason that they built this tower is because I think they wanted to present themselves as greater than God. See what we can build. We can do something even greater than God. We, we can put ourselves in a place where we are greater than God. And so they are afraid. There is a deep mistrust. And the third thing in verse, three, in verse 4 here is they are motivated by pride. Listen to the other reason why they build the city and the tower. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower so that we might make a name for ourselves. You know, in the Bible, a name always represents everything that we have, everything that we are, and everything that we do. God's name represents everything that God has, everything that he is, and everything that he does. And what are the people here trying to do? They're trying to say, we are going to make a name for ourselves. It's, it's going to all be about who we are and what we have and what we do. And we are going to derive our identity, our fulfillment, our meaning in life, <laughs> our joy from our name. You know, don't we do the same thing? We, we, we end up thinking that... If we can just have these things or be these things, then maybe if we make a name for ourselves, we'll have fulfillment. Maybe if we accomplish this amount, maybe if we have this bank account or succeed in this business or do these things, maybe that will give us an identity and then we will have a name for ourselves. Because, because we, don't, we don't like the name we have. Uh, we, you know, we, we want to achieve a name for ourselves, and so we try to accomplish that with all that we do and all that we are. And, and basically, we end up building Babel. You know, I, I see this a lot. I, I see this quite a bit. I first saw it when I was doing quite a bit of marital counseling when I was first entering into the ministry. And, and I would sit down with couples that were in crisis, and I would put husband on a paper over here and, and wife over here. And then I would write several words in the middle. Fulfillment, meaning, identity, joy, uh, <laughs> uh, purpose. You know, and, and I would put these words, and I would say, where are you finding these things? You know, where are you making a name for yourself? Where are you finding your identity? Where are you finding these things? And, and invariably, they would point to each other and say, well, I, I married because I wanted to have an identity. You know, I married to have a name. I, I, I was hoping he would give me a name, or I was hoping she would give me a name, or I was hoping I would be fulfilled in this as I did this. But don't you understand, God wants to give us a name. He wants to give us his name. And we'll talk about this in the third point. And he wants to give us fulfillment. And as we build his name and glorify him and live for him, that's where fulfillment comes. That's where we have an identity that will never let us down. That's where we have true joy. A lot of us are, are, are in relationships trying to find identity and meaning and joy. We're, in, we're, we're trying to, in our careers, find identity, meaning, and joy, but it's not there. Uh, but how come people climb to the peak and the pinnacle of their careers? And, and, you've, and you see all these people that are at the top of their game, and, and whether it's sports or entertainment or business, and they want to kill themselves. Uh, because they get there thinking that their name would somehow bring fulfillment and joy and meaning, and it doesn't, and they feel so empty they want to die. I mean, why? Because, because our name won't do that, but God's name will. And so here they are, afraid, they're deeply mistrustful. They are, they are given into pride. And the second truth about this city is this. The city resisted diversity and imposed uniformity. Well, where'd you get that? We'll go back to verse 1. Now, the whole world had one language and the same words. And another translation says, and a common speech. And so here we're being told the world had one language and one language. Well, why are we being told that twice? They had one, one language and the same words. Uh, be, because a point is being made. And the point is this. Everybody speaks the same language, but they also have the same thoughts, concepts, and ideas. 
And there's only one reason why everybody would have the same thoughts, concepts, and ideas, and that's because someone's telling them what to think. And they are in a culture where somebody is telling them what to think. And I believe as, as the diversity started to impact the earth and as the children of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and many of them here are clustering in, in the area of Babel, as they start to show their cultural distinctives, as they start to live out who, who God made them to be, I think it caused a lot of fear. And, and I think you have the first totalitarian kind of a government stepping in and saying, we're going to tell you what to think. We're going to build a tower. We're going to overlook you. And we're going to make sure you don't step out of line. And, and, and this, this is how we are going to govern you. We, we are going to have unity by enforcing uniformity. And I think that's what you have in Babel. Why do I think that? Because <laughs> uh, look at who builds Babel. When you go back to, when you go back to Genesis chapter 10, and, and chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, by the way, is like a throwback. You read chapter 10, and chapter 11, verses 1 through 9 kind of takes you back to the beginning at some point of chapter 10, and then you go back to the, to, to the names. So I, I won't go into that, but you can read it on your own. And, and who is it that actually built Babel? It was a man named Nimrod. And Nimrod ends up building and establishing this city, and he calls it Babel. And I think, I think Nimrod is the guy who's actually leading the charge when it comes to fear, when it comes to, to, to distrust, mistrust, when it comes to uh, the, the pride that people are giving into. I think he's leading the charge. The name Nimrod means rebellion. That's what the name means. And so you've got a leader, and his name is Nimrod, meaning rebellion, and he's leading this rebellion ultimately against God, establishing a city that's in rebellion to God. Nimrod is also called a mighty man in battle and a great warrior of old, depending on your translation. The same words were used in chapter 6, referring to the Nephilim and others who were mighty in battle, but the word mighty means violent and brutal. And so Nimrod undoubtedly was, was violent and brutal. And here he is establishing this city and resisting diversity, imposing uniformity. Number three, what's the third truth about this passage? Listen to it here. God wants us to have unity in diversity and for this to glorify his name. I mean, this is God's plan, unity in diversity, not uniformity. God wants us to have unity in diversity and for this ultimately to glorify his name. Go back to verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that people were building. And if you get into the Hebrew, there's a play on words here. That the Lord came down, way down, to see the, this, these ants that are building the tower because he had to come way down to see what they were building. And so, and so it's almost a condescending language. God had to come way down to see these ants so that he might look at what they were doing. And the Lord said, verse 6, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. You know, if you're just pulling those verses out of context, it sounds like a pretty insecure God. Well, I'm a little bit threatened by them. You know, if they can accomplish a tower that's, you know, eight stories tall, wow. You know, imagine what else they can do. But, but, but God isn't threatened by them at all. It's, it's not pettiness. It's not insecurity. What God is saying is this. If they are building the way they are building, with the same violence and brutality in which they are building, uh, enforcing uniformity, fighting against diversity, if they are doing these things, what more violence might they cause and bring upon people? And so out of an act of love and grace, God confuses their language. And he does. He confuses their language. And then in verse 8, the Lord scattered them all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. So God did two things. He, he scattered them. That was his will and his plan all along, that the differing people groups and cultures would spread out into the whole earth and populate the earth and thrive. Why? Because God 
wanted diversity. That this is, this is God's plan. Diversity is not a curse. It's not a punishment. It, it was what God wanted all along. The city was resisting this diversity, so God scattered them. And then the second thing that God did is God confused their speech. In other words, he gives them different languages. Now, there's one thing, and I, I did quite a bit of reading on this, there's one thing that scholars and historians and linguists uh, all agree on. Nobody has any clue how all these languages got started. You know, n n nobody does. And, and, and uh, as a matter of fact, in Paris in 1867, the, 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 the university there actually said, we are going to ban any more discussions about where languages came from because we absolutely don't know. And that, that kind of stayed <laughs> intact. And so scholars basically say, we don't know. Uh, here in Scripture, God says, L let me tell you, I had a hand in it, you know, and, and I started digging into this and, and looking into this a little more closely, and I, I want to show you something that's going to blow you away, okay? And we're going to put some Chinese words back here on the screen, and as we look at these Chinese words back here, I, I kind of want to go these, uh, I want to go through these words and kind of tell you what they mean. Now, we have quite a few Mandarin Chinese speakers in our church. And so this past week, I sat down with some of them, and they kind of pointed this out to me. So the first word is Chuan. It means ship. And if you look at the symbols around Chuan, it means vessel plus eight plus mouths. So a vessel with eight mouths. So if you want the Chinese word for ship, it's, it's a vessel with eight people. Where did they get that from? Anybody else wonder about that? Uh, wh where, where was there a vessel with eight mouths? Anybody? It was Noah's Ark. <laughs> okay. Well, th that, that's not alone. Okay. Here, how about the word how for good? In, in, in Chinese, the word how is good. And the symbols are woman plus man together equals good. So the symbol on the left is a woman. The symbol on the right is man. Where did they get this? God said it is not good for man to be alone. And so he created a woman as a suitable helper for him. And then he saw everything, and it was good. What's the Chinese word for good? Woman plus man together, instead of man alone. Where do they get that? Anybody? I mean, seriously. How about this? The word for flood, okay, it gets better. The word for flood is the Chinese word hong. And here's what hong means. Water covered the total earth. That's the word for flood. And the word total, if you get into Hong right there, the symbol for total is this, eight people together on earth. Eight together earth. So if you want the Chinese word for total, it's eight together earth. Where did they get that? Where did that come from? Anybody? <laughs> I mean, it kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? Or how about this? Do you know the Chinese word for tower is the word ta? And here's what the word tower means, that bottom word. Soil and hay mixed together, people with one mouth. And, and, and it's, it's mouth at the bottom, but it also can be language. So soil and hay mixed together, people with one tongue, one language. What's that talking about? Genesis 11. I, it, you can't get it anywhere else, and you can't make this up. Where, where did the Chinese language get these symbols? Clearly, at some point after Babel, you've got these languages emerging, and the Chinese language is emerging with these symbols that come from this story. And these stories, and this symbol makes up, and these symbols make up the, the bed of their language system. And so I share that with you just to say, if you're wanting some proof, I mean, just take a look. I mean, this, this kind of blows my mind. I hope it blows your mind when you start thinking about these things. Where did all this come from? So, <laughs> Babel was built on fear, mistrust, and pride. Babel tried to bring unity, but all they could do was, 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 was enforce uniformity. And since that time, and, and all you have to do is study history, cities and nations of kingdoms have tried to bring unity, but all they've ever been able to accomplish is uniformity. 
You know, that's, all, that's the best any nation has been able to accomplish, is to take the diverse cultures and to enforce uniformity. In other words, let's enforce one language, one primary culture. Let's make everyone speak the same way, dress the same way, do the same things. You know, and, and, and there's that uniformity. But God's goal all along is that we would have unity in diversity. And that wasn't realized at all until, <laughs> until God came down a second time. And when God came down a second time in Jesus, you get a much different story. He comes down this time as a sacrifice for our sins. And he comes down again, and instead of scattering us, he unites us through his shed blood, through his forgiveness. He, he now brings a unity, whereas we are different peoples of differing ethnicities and of differing cultures and of differing languages, but he now brings a unity that is not a uniformity, but is a unity that is through him. It's something Babel couldn't accomplish, Babylon couldn't accomplish. The Persian Empire couldn't accomplish it. Alexander the Great, Greece couldn't accomplish it. The Roman Empire certainly couldn't accomplish it. And let's get honest, America hasn't been able to accomplish it. How do we have unity? How can we attain that? It's not uniformity. It's a unity that only God can bring. He came down. Instead of giving us the diversity of languages, he unites the diverse languages through his spirit. Where do you get that? Well, listen to Acts chapter 2. The, the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles in the upper room, and, and, and here they are, and they're in Jerusalem afraid of everybody because this is where Jesus is killed. And by the way, they're still looking for the body of Jesus, undoubtedly, and, and they're, they're hunting down the disciples. And here they are in Jerusalem, but the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and what do they do? They go out and they start speaking to everybody and people from all over the world are in Jerusalem that day. It says in verse 5 of Acts 2, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. And, they, and, and basically it mentions in Acts 2, people from all these countries, all these regions, all these descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and, and they mention these countries. And it says, utterly amazed, they asked Aren't all those speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Here's the beauty of Pentecost. God didn't now make everyone Hebrew. God spoke through Aramaic, Hebrew-speaking disciples, and everyone heard in their own language. There was a unity now that wasn't based on language. There is a unity now that is based on the Spirit of God. And that unity is what bound them together. And that unity not only bound them together, but it brought them together as family and as one. And God came down the second time, and you know what he does? He gives us a name. Jesus says, I want you to take my name. Do you know the first time that Christians are actually called Christians is in Antioch, and it's in Acts chapter 13, and it says the Christians for the first time are called Christians. What does Christian mean? You know, we use the word flippantly. We, we think, well, culturally, I was born to Christian parents, and maybe I attend church every now and then, so I'm a Christian. That, that's not what a Christian means. A Christian means a little representation of Christ Jesus. That's what Christian means. And do you know that, <laughs> that we got our name? in Antioch. And why is that important? Because Antioch was the most ethnically divided city in the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, historians tell us that there were huge walls built to separate the differing ethnicities because they hated each other. And they wanted to kill each other, and they didn't want to get along with each other. And so they had these huge walls. I mean, you go into Jerusalem today, you can see the different quarters in Jerusalem where people segregated off into these quarters so they wouldn't kill each other. Antioch was even worse. And so in Antioch, they, they segregated off into these walled up areas because they didn't want to interact. They, they didn't want to kill each other. And so that's how they got along. <laughs> but something happened in the church. Something unique happened in the church. Acts 26, 11, 26, the disciples, excuse me, were called Christians at Antioch. But in Acts 13, it describes the Christians at Antioch. And here's what it says. 
in Acts 13.1. Now the church at Antioch, there were these, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And so the elders of this church, the leaders of this church were from Cyprus, Sudan, Libya, someone who grew up in Herod's court but was more Roman than Jewish, and then Saul, who was a Pharisee. And these were the leaders of the church, and they represented the differing people groups in Antioch that hated each other, but something happened in the church. They all came together as family, and they loved each other, and it blew the world away. For the first time, now there is unity in diversity where people don't sacrifice their culture. They don't sacrifice their language. They don't sacrifice any of the things that make them unique, but they come together based on the Holy Spirit, and they come together as family, and they love each other. And an unbelieving world started to believe. (laughs) They treated each other as equals, and an unbelieving world started to believe. They called them Christians. Notice this. They didn't call them African Christians. They didn't call them Jewish Christians. They didn't call them Roman Christians or Hebrew Christians. They called them Christians. Tony Evans says, I am not a black Christian. I am a Christian who is black. And he goes on to say this. Our sociology, how we see ourselves in relation to others, cannot influence our theology, how we see God. Our sociology, Tony Evans says, cannot influence our theology. If our sociology, how we see ourselves, influences our theology, we are going to be diverse and separate, and we will never be together. Our sociology doesn't influence our theology. Our theology has to influence our sociology. How we see God now has to influence how we see each other. And this is what the church is about because how we see God now changes how we see each other. Now we can celebrate the differing languages and cultures that each other represents. And now now we can fully engage each other. And the beauty of it is now we become family with people who are a world apart. Now we become family with people we may not understand as we listen to, but we are united in Christ, and that makes us closer than maybe we are to our neighbors. And that, that is what the church is about. That is the unity that God brings, and he gives us a name. Jesus came down again and makes us one. John 17, 20 through 21, Jesus prays, and this is his prayer. My prayer is not for them alone, he says, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. And why? Listen to this last part. So the world may believe. An unbelieving world will believe the truth of the gospel when they see it lived out, when you and I, across racial, ethnic, language, national lines, love each other as family. That's what an unbelieving world needs to see. More so even in America now. This is what people need to see. This is what the world needs to see. Here at the Family Church, we have 32 nations represented here at the Family Church speaking 14 first languages other than English. And we had lots of friends and, and friends that we call family over to our house for Thanksgiving. That's, that's what we do. We don't have family necessarily that live here, extended family. So we have people come over. And I didn't realize until after everyone was over, we had seven nations represented at our Thanksgiving meal, speaking five first languages, all of us. <laughs> and five first languages in seven nations from Asia to the Middle East to the Caribbean to South America or to Latin America, seven, seven nationalities and seven and five languages. But we loved each other as family. And, and, and we are. You see, this is what God wants to do. And so let let, let me ask you something. (laughs) Have you received what Jesus came to give? Because that's where it all begins. It begins by receiving what he died on the cross to give, and that's the forgiveness of your rebellion, your sin. Your rebellion that says, I call the shots. 
I determine right and wrong. I am the master of my own soul. I am the captain of my own soul, perhaps, if you know the poem. You know, I, I, it's all about me, the rebellion. He died to cure us and to heal our heart, which is desperately wicked and deceitful and beyond cure. He died that we might be forgiven. And he not only died that we might be forgiven, but he puts his spirit in us that we might live together as family and love each other as family. He came to do this, and, and, and if you don't have this, if you don't have what Jesus died to give, then, then, then the second part doesn't apply to you. But if you do, all this applies to you. And, and I want to ask you and urge you and encourage you, do you have this? I want to pray with you, and after I pray, I'm going to ask our, our ushers to pass communion through the rows, and we're going to go back to why Jesus came down. He came down <laughs> that we might have forgiveness through him. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, some of us are here today, and if we get really honest, we don't really know you. What we might be culturally Christian, because we have a loose association with the church, but we are not yet a little representation of you. We don't yet represent your name, all that you are and all that you do to the community around us, to, to, the, to, to our, our, place of work, uh, our place of work, to our school classmates, to our, our neighborhood. And we ask that we would. Jesus, the, the first step is to trust in you, to say, Jesus, I, I need why you died on that cross. I need the forgiveness that you bled and died to give. I need it to cleanse me because, because I'm rebellious at my core. And, and, and I, I want to not make a name for myself, but Jesus, I want to live to glorify your name. I want to live to, to bring glory to you because left to my own devices, I'm going to live to bring glory to me. And if I've given my life to you, Jesus, I, I want to be one, literally one. Just as, this is your prayer. I want to be one, not just with people like me, but with people who aren't like me. I, I, I want to love and be family with people who I might not even understand when we talk to each other. But we are united by you. And because we are united by you, we are brothers and sisters in you, and we are family. Lord, may we, may we understand and embrace and thrive in what family is all about. As we take communion today, Lord, I pray that we would do so as people who have been forgiven, as people who have taken your name, as people who are desiring to say, Lord God, may the world around me know you because of the way I live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.